guys. I'm not at Woodlands Church today because I am preaching in uh, Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, I appreciate your prayers as one of the missions of our church is to build into the lives of the pastors and churches there in Sweden that are making an impact because only 1% of the people in Stockholm go to church. It's the most atheistic country in the world, but there are some churches there that are bright lights shining in the darkness, and it's our goal to really encourage them and to help them so that God can bring a real move of His Holy Spirit in that place to make an impact in that culture. So um, I'm preaching at four churches in Stockholm in one day, and so I can hurry and get back to Woodlands Church. Um, I'll be preaching first at Elam Church, and then I'll finish at Hillsong Church in Stockholm. So pray for me. My voice will hold out. And I can't wait to get back with you. But I'm so excited for you because we continue the series this weekend that we're calling Weird because normal's not working. And if you want what normal people have, do what normal people do. That is, if you want to live a stressed out life and feeling empty on the inside all the time, then live like normal people live because that's normal. But if you want what few people have, peace, fulfillment, meaning, and purpose then you've got to get off of that normal road onto the narrow road that Jesus Christ talked about. And so today we're talking about weird money because this is right where we live. And you're so um, privileged because here at Woodlands Church today we have financial expert Dave Ramsey. And Dave's been a friend of Woodlands Church for many years. Uh, Dave is also on the Fox Business Network with his own television show. He has a syndicated radio show that goes all over. Um, Dave is just making a huge impact with his best-selling books and his teaching. And he's one of the most generous guys I know. And he's given the church you know, thousands of his book, Extreme Money Makeover. And we'll be giving those out to make an impact as well. But uh, I-, I want you to give a warm Woodlands Church welcome to Dave Ramsey as he teaches us that normal is not working when it comes to money. So get ready to get weird in a God kind of way. Thank you. Wow. Oh, you guys are awesome. Good morning. Well, I, uh, I checked the weather last week, and I appreciate you folks turning the thermostat down before I got here. Oh, my goodness gracious. Well, thank you to Carrie and to Randy and to the, this whole place. You guys are absolutely incredible. We're honored to be here. I can't believe I'm standing here. I feel like a wiener in a steakhouse. This is, <laughs> this is amazing. You guys are something else. This is a, a great, great place to be. For those of you that, many, many, many of you that have never heard of anything like a Dave Ramsey or anything like that, what I do, and I need to tell you this because it sets up the story on where we're going, what I do is for 20 years I've taught people God's and Grandma's ways of handling money, common sense ways of handling money, getting out of debt and being on a budget and living on less than you make, a concept Congress can't grasp. And, um, (laughs) you know, I teach these common sense basic stuff to folks and and teach them how to transform their lives by being, as Carrie said, weird. Because if you do normal things, you're going to get normal results. If you do weird things, you're going to get weird results. And wealth is weird. And personal finance is about 80% behavior. It's only about 20% head knowledge. So that's what we do all over the place. And that sets up where we are. I got this email the other day. I love these emails. I get these ever so often. This is just awesome. Dave, I work for the night shift. I work the night shift for the Toyota plant in Indiana. We were just offered your class on financial wellness as a new employee benefit, and that's great, but dead is not what this email is about. I've been searching for help, but I didn't know what I was looking for. I've been talking to some people at work. They've been some help, and I felt I was on the right track. Last night, I got in the car after work. I felt led to listen to your bonus CD, which as you know is your personal testimony. To make a long story short, at five o'clock in the morning in a deserted parking lot, I prayed with you and asked Jesus to come into my life. I sat in my car and I cried like a baby. Not felt this good in a very long time. I'm 46 years old. 
and I've broken about all the Big Ten, but now I can start over because of what Jesus did for me. God was in control all along. He led me to Toyota, then to you, and then to him. You are right. He does have a plan for me. Eternally grateful, Carl. Yes! Whoa! Now that's why I get up every morning. That's good stuff. See, I'm sneaky. <laughs> Corporate America thought they hired me to help their employees with their money. <laughs> I'm sneaky. That's okay. Let me ask you something. How many of y'all work for a church? Good. How, how many of you own your own businesses? How many of you work for a business? How many of you are in ministry? Trick question. The Bible says we are all royal ambassadors. That we are all in ministry. And somehow we've lost a little bit of that in our culture. You see, a few years ago, my wife and I, about 20 years ago, I did stupid with zeros on the end. How many of you have ever done something stupid? Raise your hand. How many of you that didn't raise your hand have a problem with lying? <laughs> I did stupid with zeros on the end, and it caused us to lose everything we owned. We went completely broke, and I had to start over. I had a I surrender all moment as a Christian. I met God on the way up, but I got to know him on the way down. And I had an all, I surrender all moment. I'm not talking about a Baptist altar call. I mean, I surrendered. I really did it. I said, that's it. I'm not doing it my way anymore. I'm doing it his way, period. And, and if it's not in here, if I can't figure it out according to this, I'm not doing it. And so I'm not only going to run my money this way, I, I'm, I'm going to do my marriage this way. And I found those parts where she has to do what I say. I like those parts. <laughs> and then she pointed out the other parts. <laughs> Submit yourselves one to another. Who can find a virtuous wife? Part of her husband safely trusts her. You'll have no lack of gain. I got it. Okay. My kids looked all through here. They couldn't find time out. <laughs> Dad, what's this rod stuff? Come over here, baby. I'll tell you. It's, um... <laughs> and then when we opened our business to help people with money, God's ways, we said, all right, that's it. We're going to run the business, WWJD. As best we can figure out, we're going to try to do everything in this business the way God would do it. Now, it's hard. It's not all in there. I mean, insurance isn't covered in second hesitations, right? I mean, but you can get the spirit of what to do off of this. And all of us, whether we work for someone, whether we own the own business, or whether we work for a church, all of us are in ministry. And so I think it's very, very important that we realize how we live our lives seven days a week screams about our Jesus. If you're going to put a fish on the back of it, you ought to drive it right. <laughs> so if you go in there talking about how you're a Christian but you're late for work, you're a thief. You just stole for your, from your employer. They're paying you, and you weren't there on time. You got to be there early. If you're going to put a fish on it, baby, you got to bring it. It's game on. You got to bring excellence into the marketplace. I'm on, on, I'm on 500 radio stations in North America today. You know why? And they're not all Christian stations. As a matter of fact, just a couple of them are. I'm not mad at Christian stations, but I wanted to go into the marketplace and take back a segment of it for Jesus. We want to go in there and bust it, baby. And that's what I want to challenge you with this morning. So when we got ready to put this Entree Leadership book together, it's the book of how we've run our business for the last 20 years. How we grew it from a card table in our living room to, well, 310 team members and best place to work the last five, six years in Nashville voted our home city. We have people lining up begging to go to work because they want to join in this culture 
this incredible culture that we built of excellence, this incredible success story. They want to be part of it. And all the dumb things I have done in 20 years to get to that point. And so I started thinking, okay, I know there's five things in the Bible that if you do these five things with money, as long as you make money and then you do these five things with money, I'll tell you what they are in a few minutes. If you do those five things with money, over a period of time, 15 or 20 years, you will become wealthy. And that's not prosperity gospel. It's cause and effect. Okay? You reap what you sow. You can't stand at the end of the row and say, you know, I think I'm going to watch and see if corn just happens to grow. You actually have to plant some corn. And so what you put in the ground is what comes out. And that's true in your life as well. And so if you do those five things with money over an extended period of time, you'll win. So I started thinking, what about, what about if I'm an employee in business and that's my ministry? Because my life is my ministry. What about if I'm a, a business owner or I'm in leadership? And, and what if I'm, how do I function in the marketplace? What are the key things that caused us to go from zero to 60, to go from a card table to a major national brand in 20 years? What are the biblical things that we ended up doing that, that I mean, there's a whole bunch of things we did, obviously, but what were the key principles? And I want to unpack those for you today. And the devil hates it when you take notes. So if you want to write down the five things, I'll give them to you. The first one is this. Here's my HR manual. You ready? Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Treat other people like you want to be treated. Number one principle we figured out is if you want to win long term in the marketplace, people matter. Number one principle. People matter. Your customers are not units of revenue. These are people with a story. They got two kids, a dog, might even have a cat. They just had to put grandma in a nursing home. And their best friend just died of cancer. People matter. So when your customers come across and you're putting tires on their car or you're working on their heat and air system or you're serving them at a restaurant or wherever it is you're interacting with them, these are people. Now, if you're not in the counseling industry, you're probably not going to hear their story, but you can look into their eyes, the windows to the soul, the Bible says, and you'll see parts of the story. It'll just flash right there in front of you. If you bother and treat people like they matter. Your vendors, when you interact with them, they matter. Your, your, your employees, maybe they're not employees, maybe they're team members. Maybe we're all doing this together. If you treat your employees like sacks of corn and set them on the sidewalk, then don't be shocked when they're not motivated. Don't be shocked when they're not all jazzed about helping the organization hit its goals. Here's an idea. Treat people like they matter. you got to love on your people. you got to care about them deeply. And we do. We do. It's one of the reasons we win best place to work every year. My friend Rabbi Lappin, Rabbi Daniel Lappin, he's an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. He's fabulous. I love this guy. He wrote a book called Thou Shall Prosper, Why Jewish People Tend to Prosper. It's wonderful. Why is it 3% of Americans are Jewish and 67% of the Forbes 400 is? I want to know this. I want, and he's a great guy. He says, he says, Dave, everybody needs a rabbi, even you Christians. <laughs> so he's my rabbi. He's my buddy taught me a lot. He's a brilliant, brilliant man. He says one of the reasons that Jewish people prosper is that they understand that their opportunities out there in the world, all of your opportunities do not come from your talent. Almost none of them do, as a matter of fact. Your opportunities that come to you, those people that seem to be lucky, every time I meet lucky, it's dressed in work clothes. These people that seem to be lucky realize their opportunities come through other people your connectivity. Number one way you get a job is not sitting in front of your computer filling out 73,000 applications online. You will never get hired that way. You're going to have to take the sweatpants off, comb your hair, get in the car, and go see some people. <laughs> That's how it happens. That's where it comes from. 
And it may be the kid, it may be the, the wife of the person, your, your, your kid, or, or the wife of the soccer coach that coaches your kid has a business that hires you. That's how you get hired in stuff, really, out here in the real world. It's not that you walked in with the appropriate amount of degrees and you have the talent. See, that's the biggest myth in our culture. The number one correlation between people who become very successful is not their GPA. It is their relational IQ. People matter. Nobody wants to work with a jerk, even if they're talented. I mean, if he's on a football team, they won't throw to him. They just stand over there going, where's the ball? I'm Hall of Fame, where's the ball? It's because we just don't like you. And we really don't want you to look good. Don't, isn't that what happens in the real world? Your opportunities come through people, and people matter. We've got a saying around our place. One of our core values is, if you help enough people, you don't have to worry about money. How about that instead of, I wonder how much profit we can make on this product line. Now, we're wise because the Bible says to be diligent to know the state of your flocks and herds. So we look at what the profit margin's on. We're not stupid. We've got to pay payroll Friday. But we don't start with that. We start with, does this really help someone? Or are we just milking the cow here? What's really going on? Are we really lifting someone's life and helping them transform their future? The second one is an incredible team and culture of excellence matters. If you want to win, you've got to build an incredible team around you and a culture of excellence in that team. You've got to bring a bunch of champions that, that say, game on, baby, Super Bowl is every day. You got you to step it up. You got to bust it. You got to kick it in gear. And there is no leadership out there that causes that to happen except servant leadership. Leaders that are real leaders are not bosses. They understand they're there to serve. Now, the first time I heard that at a Christian conference, I thought, servant leadership. That sounds like that won't work. Because I didn't hear servant, I heard subservient. Well, I'm not subservient. But servant leadership simply means I care enough about the people that I'm leading that I can take their best interest at heart while I'm making my decisions. And sometimes I take their best interest at heart and they are allowed to leave our organization. Fly and be free in Jesus' name. Because at this particular job, you are awful, child of God. You are awful, horrible. You need to go find something that you're gifted at where people aren't ready to kill you. I had a young man doing sales for us and he didn't have the, he was a young guy and he didn't have the stuff it took to quit. Because he was awful. And we fired him. How do we do that? Not like last week's sack of corn. Man, we're going to help you. What's your dream? What do you want to be when you grow up? That's what you need to be doing. You don't need to be doing something you hate. You hate coming to work every day and everybody around you knows it. And we don't allow that around here. So we got to figure out what you're going to be when you grow up. You know what? He's number, one of the top photographers now, four years later, in the whole city of Nashville. Does album covers for some of the big artists. And he never would have been that had I kept him there. And I didn't have the courage as a leader to serve him well. I can love him well while he leaves. Isn't that fun? That's weird. You know, I get thank you notes from people I fired. Because <laughs> they get to go do what they were supposed to be doing. It turns out you cannot work for us and still go to heaven. <laughs> wow. See, there's an interesting story in here in Genesis. It says, um, Genesis 11, it's the story of the Tower of Babel. And if you don't know the story, the people built a huge tower to worship God, and then the tower was so cool, they started worshiping the tower. And God wasn't really into your worship and other stuff other than him, and so he came down, and this is the line in Genesis 11, and the Lord said, indeed the people are one, and they all have one language. This is the power of unity. And this is what they begin to do, a bad thing. 
Now nothing they propose to do will be withheld from them. Negative story, but a positive principle there. When the people are of one mind and one language, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. When you can build an organization and a culture that is unified, you nothing can stop it. So we had to figure out what the enemies of unity were. The first one I discovered very on in my career, very early on in my career. And I can't stand it. It's one of the few things that makes me so passionate that people confuse me with being very angry because I probably am. I can't stand gossips. If you gossip working for us, we warn you once and then we will fire you. I have a zero tolerance policy for gossip in the workplace. Is that, is that legal? Yes, gossips are not a protected people group. Now, here's how it works at our place. You're going to have problems. You're going to have problems. If you're not going to have problems, we probably don't need you because you're probably moving something around. And when you move something around, there's always friction. So there's going to be problems. Count on problems. They're going to happen. It's just part of life. Be ready. There's problems. And when you have problems, you have one option with your problems in our organization. Hand it up. Bring your problems up. Bring them to leadership. Don't sit down in front of my receptionist desk. Her title is Director of First Impressions. Her job is to make you feel good when you call in. And so you can't sit down in front of her desk and go, you know, I can't make any sales. The sales manager's stupid. I don't have any business cards. And IT can't keep my computer fixed. You'd think leadership would help the salespeople. Once I will warn you. And we tell you this when we're hiring you, by the way. And you know what? It sounds so harsh the way I'm talking about it up here, doesn't it? Because we're in church and he got fired. You know, but, you know, our people love it. We've been doing this for years, and it's like, it's a big deal. The media's interviewing me. You have a no gossip policy? Yeah, because that tears organizations apart from the inside out. It's a rot in the center of them. Some of these organizations are cesspools, and it's all just because people are just doing us all the time. You got work to do. I got a lot of work to do. I'm getting people out of debt. Me and Jenny Craig got a big job. (laughs) You ain't got time to be doing that stuff. We got stuff to do. And here's what's fun. Once you do it for a while, people love the environment so much that it self-polices. Leadership doesn't even have to get involved. Some new person comes on board and they forgot that part of the interview process. And they start that, and somebody will be going, wait, 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 you're confused. We don't do that here. And, and then if they see you again, they'll say, listen, we don't do that here. And next time you're doing it, I'm not going to stand near you because I don't want this to go off and hit me. Because leadership around here is serious about that. And, and, you know, almost never in the last several years have we had any issue with that. But it took a little while to make everybody believers. Had to send a couple of my sisters in Christ and brothers in Christ on their way for this. And then all of a sudden, everybody started believing. Well, you don't sound, you sound kind of harsh. Well, that's fine. Then don't work for me. It's all good. Because this is an environment that's fun to work in. And everybody's fired up and wired up. The third one that we the reason we know we've won is slow and steady matters. We live in a microwave culture. And organizations that win and people that win are more like crockpots. Paul says to run the race, when you look the race up, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Do your Hebrew research, your Greek research. It's a, it's a marathon. Slow and steady wins the race. I was meeting with this Christian brother of mine who's about 70 years old, wonderfully successful guy. He's a billionaire. That's a thousand million. That's a lot. And I was asking him, if I want to be you when I grow up, he's got a great marriage, great kids, great family, great business. I mean, looking in from the outside, I know the guy, everybody has problems, but man, I'm just looking at this guy going, man, I want to be him when I grow up. This is incredible. So when I meet people that are highly successful in different areas of their life or multiple areas of their life, I study them. I want to to emulate that. In business, we call that best practices. Find what they're doing and copy it, right? And and so I'm asking him, I'm like, what do I do? And he said, well, you need to do this. You need to be generous. All people are generous. Yeah, I got that generous piece. I learned that a long time ago. Yeah, you do. And and, and I said, what? what?" He said, there's a book you need to read. And I went, oh, because I love books. I think the answer is in books, you know. I think there's, you, you know, you need to get to a book. 
And I, he started saying, tell me this book. He said, I, I've read this book for years. I read it to my kids. I read it to my grandkids. Now I'm reading it to my great-grandkids. And, and I've asked my children to make sure that they read it to their grandkids and great-grandkids. He said, this book will change your life. And I said, okay, so it's the Bible. He said, well, you need to read the Bible, certainly. But it's not what I'm talking about. So I got my pen ready. What's the book? This is a book a billionaire is recommending. What's the book? He said, Dave, have you ever read the book, The Tortoise and the Hare? That's what you got for me. That's a breakthrough right there. He said, he said, Dave, really, some of the most simple things you ever learn in your life are some of the most profound and life-changing. Listen to this carefully. We live in a culture full of hares. They run around the whole culture's ADD. You know? Can't even watch a television show all the way through. Guilty. And the tortoise doesn't care what other people think. The tortoise is weird. The tortoise is not like everybody else. He's slow, he's steady, he's ugly, and he sees the finish line. And he doesn't quit ever until he gets there. The number two cause of business failure in North America today is too much success. When a business or an organization becomes too successful and they, 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 they move past their financial ability to carry the success and they move past their, uh, their, their human resources, the quality of their team to carry the success, the business and organization will fall in on itself. And it's the number two cause of business failure and organizational failure and church failure and any other kind of failure out there is people move past their abilities and they get over here on the edge and they fall off. Slow and steady wins the race. I don't do bubbles. I invest slow and steady. I'm okay if we grow our organization a little slower. We're not going to take that project on. We don't have the money to do it right now. We're not going to take that project on until God sends us the person that is on fire about this idea to the point that they almost cry every time they talk about it. Now I got the right one. And now we're ready to move on. Now we're ready to, until that happens, we're just going to sit and wait. Yeah, but Dave, you're going to miss the market and the competitors are going to come in. And, 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 and you know what? I'm just not a worrier. I'm not a worrier. I've learned over 20 years. Because every time I step out there past that, I get the hair knocked off my head. It's painful. Notice Carrie's done that too. You know, it, it's painful. So I'm just going to be slow and steady wins the race. A couple years ago, I, I run half marathons these days. I ran three in the spring. I'm going to run San Antonio down here in the, in the fall, and I run half marathons. But a few years ago, I ran two full marathons in one day, my first and my last. <laughs> 26 miles. 26.2 miles. Don't forget the point two. Somewhere in that last mile, I was running so slowly, a guy wearing a tutu passed me. <laughs> but I finished. I finished. I felt like when I went across the line, I was sprinting. But the videotape shows otherwise. The videotape looks more like this. That's about the speed I went across. Man, I was in so much pain. I blew an IT band at mile 17, and I was going to finish no matter what. But you know what I figured out? It's just you get the big things finish. And now I've done mine, so check that off the bucket list. I enjoy the others. You can recover from them in 10 years. And, but man, oh man, it's absolutely crazy. So slow and steady wins the race. Slow and steady wins the race. Don't be afraid in a culture that's out of control and frenetic and worried about speed to go slow. It's a principle of success. Get rich quick never works. The best way to get rich quick is to get rich slow. The diligent prosper. Diligence is excellence in the ordinary over time. It's not an instantaneous thing where we can just pop it in the microwave. I mean, you guys are in Texas. Y'all make some pretty good brisket, right? Br brisket barbecue. Is this the home of brisket barbecue? Could be. I ah, love it. Mm. There is no such thing as good microwave barbecue. This is an oxymoron. 
If you want some good barbecue, you got to cook it for days. You got to cook it till the next door neighbor dog is howling. <laughs> That's how you get good barbecue. Business and money and marriage, these things are the same way. Slow and steady wins the race. There's so much wisdom dripping out of that from that older gentleman that taught me that. It's amazing. So you know what? I don't get into bubbles. I don't have any bubbles. They don't burst if you don't have them. And so I just go slow. The fourth one is financial principles matter. How you operate your organization, how you operate your life, and we've operated our company on financial principles. The Bible says to be diligent, as I told you, be diligent, know the state of your flocks and herds, which for you business people means do the accounting. You got to keep up with what's going on. You're supposed to count stuff. You better make sure the sheep are there. Several examples of shepherds and agrarian examples all through Proverbs and the book of wisdom. And, and you start to read how to live your life. Now, I told you there's five things. And if you're in business, you can operate these five things. If you're in personal life, you can operate these five things. And if you do these five things, you will officially be weird with money. And keep in mind, normal's broke. 70% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. And only 52% are smart enough to worry about it. So, it, you know, it, it's out of control out there. Normal is looking good and broke. Normal is sitting at a stoplight impressing somebody you'll never meet. That's normal in America today. So there, there's five biblical financial principles. There's a whole bunch of them, but there's five core ones that if you do these five things over and over and over again, you'll win. The first one, of course, you know this from Dave Ramsey, is get out of debt and stay out of debt. The borrower is slave to the lender. When you don't have any payments, you have money. It's a weird thing. It's just so weird, it's unbelievable. But instead, we have people walking around with master card. Who named that anyway, slave? <laughs> Discovered bondage. American distress. The average car payment in America is $483, $482 over 84 months, according to the National Auto Dealers Association. By the way, if you take a $484 car payment and you invest it in a decent growth stock mutual fund in your Roth IRA from age 30 to age 70, you'll have $5.6 million in that account. I sure hope you like that car. Besides that, the stupid thing's going down like a rock. They drop in value, man. They go down like a rock. That's where Chevy got that, like a rock. <laughs> you Ford people aren't any better. It's found on the road depreciated. So, um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I like cars. I'm a boy. But I'm not going to have a car that owns me ever again. I don't want to be like everybody else. I want to be weird. I'm staying out of debt. Second one is you need to learn to act your wage. You need to learn to live on less than you make. The Bible says, In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. If you spend everything you make, God says you're a fool. Don't get mad at me. God said it. And this is not a greeting like, Hey, fool. <laughs> no, this is a biblical idiot. You don't want to be this. And I've been it. It'll make you broke. A foolish man devours all he has. Whether you're in business, you can't spend everything you make. Whether you're at home, you can't spend everything you make. These are universal principles straight out of Scripture. And they work every time. And if you don't think that they're correct, that makes you wrong. This is not negotiable. This is the Bible. It is God's Word. That's how this works. The third thing is you need to learn to save money. In the house of the wise, I said this earlier, in the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil. Wise people save money. In business, you save money. It's called retained earnings. At home, we have an emergency fund, and we save up to buy things, and we invest so we can retire with dignity and change our family tree. Wise people have savings. Fools spend everything they make. Slaves borrow money. You getting the picture here? It's laid out right there for you. Took me a while to figure this out. How do you do all this? Well, the best way to do it is have a plan. You should never build a house without a blueprint. You end up building a pretzel. The change orders cost you more than the whole house. We're building a house, or a lake house right now. I've been very demanding that every detail be 
determined about this house before we break ground on paper. It's cheap to fix stuff on paper. It's not cheap to make it up as you go. A plan. Jesus said it. He said, don't build a tower without first counting the cost, lest you get halfway up and you're unable to finish and all who see you begin to mock you and say, there's another Christian doesn't pay his bills. That last part I added. <laughs> Jesus said, have a plan. Well, I have faith. Have the faith to read the Scripture. Have a plan. Handle your money on paper, on purpose, before the month begins. If you're in business, that's budget and projections and pro formas. And every business that's run well does that into the future. You know, we're projecting the revenues for the month and the expenses for the month and the profits for the month. The same thing for your home. The last one of the five is you have to learn to be generous. God loves a cheerful giver. The word cheerful, cheerful, cheerful in that scripture is the word helios in the Greek where we get our word hilarious. God loves a giver where you just are having so much fun all the whole time. And in your organization, there ought to be a spirit of generosity. If you're in leadership or you own a company, here's an idea. Have a spirit of generosity that, that, that ekes its way into the compensation package. And as soon as it does, you're going to gain loyalty for your mere team. Had a guy on our team the other day, about, about six months ago, he works with several of our different business units pulling deals together, and he pulled this deal together and made a sale that brought our company a million dollars. <laughs> Only we looked down, and his employment agreement with us said that these are the areas he's supposed to be working in and supposed to be paid on, and here's how his commission works in these areas. The million dollar sale came in over here. So by my agreement with this guy, I don't owe him a dime. You know what we did? We paid him a full commission. Why? Because that's how I'd want somebody to treat me if I brought him a million dollars. Besides that, I want him to do it again. <laughs> Why are companies so short-sighted? You know, oh, got you on the technicality. <laughs> yeah. You think he's going to go do that again? If he does, it'll be for your competitor because he'll leave. Rock stars don't put up with that stuff, man. Can't figure out why employees won't be loyal. It's because you're not. Treat other people like you want to be treated. Be generous. Be generous. Be generous with your products. Be generous in the community. Those of you that are, that, that are employees, be generous with your time towards your only client, which is your employer. Bring it. Oh, they're jerks and they won't notice and it doesn't I will never get money from them if I'm good well that doesn't say anything about them if you're bad though it just says something about you and guess what if you're excellent in the midst of a bunch of doofuses you stick out you stand out be excellent I mean if you're a thoroughbred hanging out with donkeys people will notice and and you know what if they don't pay you and you don't end up running the whole place, somebody will steal you like their competitor. I know we were one night out to dinner. My dad, I watched this. I was 12 years old. My dad owned a residential real estate company. He was a real estate broker. And um, we were out to dinner. And this, you ever been in a good restaurant, a really nice restaurant, where the waitress or waiter just rocks it? I mean, they bring it. It was this woman. She was incredible. She waited at our table, smiling, happy, natural, not fake. Not little plastic training stuff with little badges. No, this was just her. She was just on, you know? She just relationally intelligent, came, worked the table perfectly, made friends as she was doing it, made suggestions. Somebody got ready to order something. She, you don't want that one. And she, you know, directed them away from the bad stuff. It was awesome. We got, we got through, and she was, she was 24 years old. Her name was Marilyn. We got through, and my dad handed her a business card, and he said, you want to make more money than you ever made in your life, you call me tomorrow. You don't need to be waiting tables. She went to work selling residential real estate, and this was in 1972. She sold $2 million worth of real estate that year. That'd be like selling $20 million now. She rocked it. Because, you know, that restaurant, they didn't have, that, there's no way they're going to keep her unless she's running the whole place, the whole chain of them. Because she had the stuff, you know. And, and so somebody will find you if you're excellent. The Bible says to do your work as unto the Lord. Do it as you were doing it for Jesus. 
Treat other people in that situation. Treat the customer. Treat the boss. Treat the, the, the team. Lead with a servant's heart. Do all of those things and meld them and bring them all together. Is this making sense? Say yes. Y'all are kind of quiet. It's overwhelming. It's so weird. See, businesses that do this, whether they're small or whether they're large, whether they have a fish on them or whether they don't, stand out because they succeed. These are principles that work every time. The fifth principle is this, and the last one. A higher calling matters. A higher calling matters. If you are a plumber, how, Dave, can I make that into a ministry? I own a Smoothie King. How can I make that into a ministry? Dave, I, I have a fried chicken place. How can I make that into ministry? My friend Truett Cathy figured out a way, didn't he? Chick-fil-A is a ministry. You could sell car batteries, and Norm figured out a way to make that a ministry. You could employ 12,000 people, which help people with their hobbies called Hobby Lobby, and my buddy David Green does that. And he definitely sees Hobby Lobby and Mardell Books as a ministry. These are all strong Christian men leading fabulous organizations. So why is it that you can put car batteries in and be a ministry? How can you put a... Because you, you know, you're not as concerned with what you're doing. You're concerned with why you're doing it. See, if the hot water heater goes out in my house, I need hot water. I need a shower. It's a ministry for you to get over there, put the thing in right, and if you don't do it right, you come back and fix it without bothering me, and when you get there, you're clean, and your clothes are clean, and you put those little blue booty things on for you come in my wife Sharon Ramsey's house, versus some clod hopper comes in there, tracks dirt in there, shows up, we don't know if he's homeless or if he works for this company, and I go out there, and there's parts left on the top of the unit when I, after they've worked on my heat and air unit. Screws are laying all over the ground, everything else. I'm going, parts are left over. This is not a good sign. <laughs> Excellence matters. So why you do it, when you do it for, as under the Lord, when you do whatever it is you do and you bring it with excellence, you say something not only about you and, and your belief about your work, but you say something about your relationship with Jesus as you're doing that. A higher calling matters. Why is it I can walk up between two old boys laying brick on the same job, and they're both doing a good job. One of them's doing a good job. One of them's doing an excellent job. And I, I tap the one that's doing a good job on the shoulder. I say, hey, what do you do? And he says, I'm a bricklayer. What are you doing? I'm laying brick. I tap the other one on the shoulder and say, what do you do? He said, I'm a bricklayer. What are you doing? I'm building a cathedral. And his work looks like it. He believes in the bigger picture, the why why, why, why? Why do you do what you do? Is it just to collect money? Then you need to find something else to do. If you're just there to collect money, you need to get on with your life and have some passion about what you're doing. And it doesn't mean you can quit today and not pay your house payment. But you need to get about the business and moving gradually into something that as you do it, it lights you up. I've been doing talk radio for almost 20 years now, three hours a day, five days a week. And I still get excited every day when I turn the microphone on. I still have fun. People say, how do you have the energy? You just say the same. I was with this pastor the other day. It was so funny. He said, he said I don't understand. He said, you answer the same questions every day. You, you, it's always get out of debt. He said, I, I, I mean, after 20 years of saying the same thing over and over and over again, how come you aren't bored? And I said, well, how come you're not? I mean, there's just one story in there. <laughs> it's because I'm what I'm supposed to do. That's why I was put here. You find that, your vocation becomes your vacation. A higher calling matters. So what I'm saying is this. Winning in your career, winning in leadership, winning in business, winning in an organization is just too tough. It's too tough if you don't apply these principles. If you're just doing it for money, it just it, it gets so bad, so sad, so fast. I mean, you can get you some money, get some money, that's fine. But if you eat enough lobster, it tastes like soap. I mean, really, it just 
there's only so much you can do with money. But the achievement aspect, the being able to move the needle in people's lives, being able to have served well and, and, and become a respected person in that community because of your character and how you bring it, these are the things that will change your life. So my thing is this. When you die, when you go to heaven, they're going to put two numbers on that tombstone. When it started and when you went to heaven. And my question is, what are you going to do with the dash? What are you going to do with your dash? I know what I'm going to do with mine. I'm going to be wide open. I'm going to play hard. I'm going to love hard. I'm going to dance poorly but loudly. <laughs> I'm going to go wide open. Because when I get there, I'm going in because of Jesus. But when I walk in, I want to hear, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for these people. We thank you for your word that gives us such inspiration to be the thing that you put us here to be. Show us, Father God, how to be that this week. Show us how to change our attitudes into, and to do our work in such a way that it makes you smile. That, that we can bring excellence and, and, and diligence and talent and relationships to every part of our lives in a way that witnesses to your glory. And Father God, we just thank you for these folks. We ask that you, that you touch them and that you wrap your arms around them and that you show them the plan that you have for their lives. In Jesus' name, amen.